Think of a crisis that shattered you. In that moment, did you claw for normal? Or did a quiet voice ask, what if I could be more? For centuries, we have defined resilience as the act of bouncing back, like a rubber ball sapping back to its old shape. Today, I'm gonna to challenge that assumption. Our world is tested by cracks, crashes, and chaos. As a systems engineer, I've learned that resilience isn't always about going back to what was. It is about reimagining what could be. Why? Let's go back to a time when wooden warships ruled the seas until they began to rot. Imagine the 1800s. Britain depleted seven-eighths of its virgin forests to build massive warships called 74s, named for their 74 cannons. The 74s were floating fortresses. They were engineering marvels, but they had a problem. The wood was failing. Something had to be done. And enter shipworms that bored the keels, uh, dry rot that crumbled the planks. Even Christopher Columbus was afraid of these fouling organisms than the uncharted waters. For naval powers, this was an existential crisis. Enter a pointy-nosed English engineer, Thomas Treadgold. In 1818, he did a simple experiment which turned out to be a revolutionary one. He hung weights from six different types of wood and, to see, and saw if they bent or broke. He found that larch was less stiff than oak, but had a weird power and excellent performance in resisting a moving force. He had a name for that quality. He called it resilience. Treadgold observed that trees that grew in the worst soil under the worst conditions thrived the best. Treadgold made resilience testable and measurable. Engineers could waterproof, stressproof, and rodproof what he called a species of strength. But then something else happened. Engineers had moved on to iron the legendary iron sides, as it is often the case in the nature of innovation, you completely supplant the order of technology. But the concept of resilience was still centered on elasticity, whether the system bent but not broke. So what if the original state was the problem? What if true resilience isn't about bouncing back at all. In engineering, searching for resilience isn't new. Back in 30 BCE, the Roman builder Vitruvius concocted a mortar for crack-resistant construction. It was made of volcanic ash, limestone, and seawater. The self-reinforcing concrete is the reason why the Pantheon still stands and is still studied. Engineers over the centuries have also become really good at designing materials that not just withstand stress, but also get stronger because of it. Ancient wisdom has perspectives on resilience that transcend brute endurance. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna advises the warrior Arjuna, who is despondent at that state, about the value of inner strength that comes from equipoise, unshaken by adversity. Even Zen wisdom offers something relatable. In a storm, a grass bends, but a mighty tree blows away. Over the centuries, philosophers have struggled with the concept of resilience, each coming from a different angle. For Seneca, Resilience meant to leap. To Ovid, it meant to shrink or contract. To Cicero, it meant to rebound. To Quintilian, it meant 
to avoid. So, which is it? In the 1970s, ecologist Buzz Halling was onto something. He classified engineering resilience as something that systems would snap back to equilibrium. In contrast, ecological resilience was such that systems would not merely recover, but adapt. He said that the critical moments in those adaptations were not when the systems were merely stable, but were in transition. Which takes me to a Greek god who meandered mountains and meadows, Pan, half man, half goat, flute player, and a total trickster. Pan's name meant all-encompassing. He straddled civilization and chaos. Pan, if you disturbed him during one of his afternoon naps, he would get so upset that he would unleash a contagious fear. Naturally, we have the word panic. Halling and his colleague Lance Gunderson borrowed his name to come up with an all-encompassing concept of resilience. They called panarchy. Their model was about an infinity cycle that would cross multiple levels, covering growth, stability, collapse, and renewal. These cycles were nested, so what affected in the micro level rippled up to the macro level and traveled back. Their point was, collapse isn't always a failure of the system, it is part of its renewal. Today, resilience means many things to many people. We have come up with so many different definitions that have far gone beyond tread goals, carpentry workshop, and properties of wood. It could simultaneously mean people overcoming trauma, companies engaging with supply chain problems, communities overcoming disasters, cultures preserving identities uh, amidst upheaval. So we have many more concepts of resilience. If you ask immigrants, they'll all have stories of resilience that are not just of survival, but reinvention. As an immigrant myself, now approaching 25 years in this country, I've been thinking a lot lately about my early roots back in India. My grandfather was a farmer and a temple priest. I was his assistant priest. You're looking at a photo from the mid-1980s. This is from a ceremony in our village honoring the eagle god who's transporting Vishnu, one of the trinities uh, of supreme divinity in the Hindu tradition. I am the little boy standing next to my grandfather who's in the far left. My brother is wearing brown shirt. Together, we celebrated Vishnu, in this case, who preserves cosmic order. But for me, over years, resilience meant not merely preservation, but it requires a transformation. And it is only through displacements one recognizes such transformations. For me, from that village temple to learning English, to becoming first engineer in my family history, to becoming the first person to board an airplane to come to the United States in my family history, and to land in New York a month before 9-11 were all acts of resilience. And to this current moment, every displacement actually fueled my strength, much like Treadgold's trees that were thriving in harsh soils. Put that personal aside, uh, story aside, in engineering, resilience intersects with what we call illities, agility, adaptability, reliability, composability, maintainability, retirability, flexibility. Resilience also conflicts with efficiency, which is the defining tension of our era. Back in 1975, vaccinologist Jonas Salk came up with an S-shaped curve to describe societal transitions. The rising part of the curve is what he called Epoch A, which is individualistic, 
competitive. It's all about quick wins. It's about chasing efficiency. The plateau, he called Epoch B, was collective, collaborative, had long-haul systems thinking as the feature, and focused on resilience and renewal. If Epoch A is just in time, Epoch B is just in case. In Epoch A, we dodged disasters. In Epoch B, we'll need to circumvent catastrophes. We are at the inflection point of Epoch A and Epoch B, the very dynamic tension of resilience and efficiency. Treadgold's dry treatise on carpentry had its own life. It proved to be durably, remarkably resilient. New editions of his book were published until 1946, 117 years after he died. But here's the cruel irony. Treadgold, who influenced generations of engineers, died penniless. His wealth was his book collection. His widow had to sell off his cherished encyclopedia to feed his children. This is what happens when you don't have resilient systems supporting the very people who teach us resilience. Rethinking resilience requires us to rethink how we engineer a better world. It is not about designing systems that never break, but systems that break revealingly, how we can make breakdowns into breakthroughs. True resilience isn't about bouncing back. It's about bouncing forward to where we need to be. Thank you. <laughs>